On today's show, KB and I are going to discuss the possibility of Ewan McGregor reprising his role as Obi-Wan Kenobi on a new Disney Plus series. We're also going to discuss Seth Rogen and his thoughts on The Boys Season 2. And then Kevin Smith is going to Eternia? Here are our thoughts on that. And then we have breaking news on Spider-Man's fate as it relates to the MCU. And we might also get plugged back into the Matrix. All of that, plus a little Q&A on this episode of Free Your Geek. By the power of Grayskull. Winter is coming. Finish him! Fatality. You're gonna need me on this one, Master. Oh, I agree. However, it may turn out just to be a wild panther chase. Master. I've disappointed you. I haven't been very appreciative of your training. I've been arrogant. And I apologize. I've just been so frustrated with the Council. You are strong and wise, Anakin, and I am very proud of you. I have trained you since you were a small boy. I have taught you everything I know. And you have become a far greater Jedi than I could ever hope to be. But be patient, Anakin. It will not be long before the Council makes you a Jedi Master. Obi-Wan, may the Force be with you. Goodbye, old friend. May the Force be with you. And welcome to Free Your Geek. I am your host, Jay Free, and joining me as always... KB the Geek. KB the Geek. Uh, How have you been, brother? I've been really good. Well, that's good. Um, So, we're doing a show here today. And uh, as of this recording... Really? We're doing a show here? Today? Yeah, I mean, obviously. Um, but moving forward for the next two <laughs> weeks, for the remainder of August and the first week of September, I will be KB-less. KB-less. So I have a few potential guest hosts lined up. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. But for the next possibly two shows, there will be no KB. So we kind of wanted to uh, just... Is that both of your imaginary friends? Both both of them. That's why I have two extra seats at this table, sir. <laughs> they will both be on. Um, I want to talk about some stuff, though. We got a lot. As you heard on the opening, we did a little bit of uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi and uh, Anakin Skywalker from Star Wars Episode Three. But before we even get into that, um, we put toge- I put together, you, KB, as you know, I always put together tons of notes, tons of notes, and then... You're meticulous. Yeah. But you know what? As of this recording, I found two new articles that we know nothing about that I did not include in my format for the show. So we're going to kind of scrap the stuff we planned on going into right away and talk about these two new news articles. Do you want the sad one first or do you want the the interesting one first? I'm a sad panda. Okay. Well, that's what the one I was going to go with first. Uh, This comes via deadline. Spider-Man, no longer part of the MCU. Really? Marvel Studios president Kevin Feige won't produce any further Spider-Man films because of an inability inability by Disney and Sony Pictures to reach new terms that would have given the former a co-financing stake going forward. A dispute that has taken place over the past few months at the top of Disney and Sony has essentially nixed Feige and the future involvement of Marvel from the Spider-Man universe, sources said. What do you think of that? It's not good for either side. Well, I don't think it's good for either this side. This article via Deadline it does make an interesting point. It says, This comes at a moment when the last two films Kevin Feige produced broke all-time records. Obviously, Endgame and Far From Home. And the last four, four or five films Sony produced? <laughs> uh, sources say there are two more Spider-Man uh, films in the works that are meant to have director John Watts and Tom Holland front and center. So they're still signed on. 
uh, though Watts doesn't have a deal for the next picture. So unless something drastic happens, Feige will not be the lead creative producer of those pictures. From a story perspective, it kind of makes sense because if you think about where Far From Home ended. Yeah, right? so spoiler alert in case you like, haven't watched I, I'm not going to go into that too much. I, I'm going to do it. You, you his, to, yeah. his identity was revealed to the yeah. world. So. so how like what was how was he fitting really... I mean, do do you need him in the MCU for now? Maybe you'd like to get him back later, but do you need him in there in the next phase or two? I I don't I don't really think so. Well, that's it's for Sony to break off. It's probably a good time for them to break off. KB, it's almost like you. Kn- I know you haven't heard yeah. this yet, and this is brand new to you. But the next piece of the article says sources say that Sony reasoned that they will be fine without Feige because the creative template has been set on the Spider-Man mm-hmm. films with Watt and Holland in yep. place, along with Amy Pascal, who became the producer with Feige after she exited the executive suite after presiding over the previous Spider-Man iterations directed by Sam Raimi and Mark Webb as Sony Pictures chief. So she's still on board. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I don't know. This is so it's just, it's just kind of going to be kind of interesting to see like this universe kind of disconnected. Now to your point, Yes, I don't think they need Spider-Man and the MCU to kind of go hand in hand. With to go the, forward. With, yeah. yeah, but at the same time, the feeling of that connected universe, are we going to see, is it still going to feel connected as they move forward? Like, yeah. it'd be one of those things like, again, he's already tangled with the Avengers, so now if it's something big popping up, it's like, why wouldn't the Avengers show up? You know, even even in Far From Home, yeah. you mentioned Captain Marvel, Thor, Doctor Strange. It's will in they, people's minds. Will they uh, even be able to mention that anymore now? Depends how the contracts about, are written, And right? think about I mean, everything else. Like, think about, as far as we, we talked about the X-Men, the Fantastic Four. Think about the friendship between Daredevil yeah. and Spider-Man. Johnny Storm and Spider-Man. That's yeah. all going to be next. So it could hurt some of the point. upcoming projects, yeah. I don't Depending know. Depending on what Feige had planned. That's interesting. Well, Sony, Sony's got a lot coming underway. Again, from this article from uh, Variety, which I will include in the show notes. Uh, Venom sequel is already well underway. With I think... An- now. Not not to stop you there, but I think that that might be another reason is that Sony, I think, felt that they did really well with Venom. Maybe not from a critic's point of view, but from a box office point of view. Like, it did make a lot of money. But I believe Foggy had his hand in helping with that, too. I, I don't know. I, I believe I believe that was the case. But yes, the Venom sequel is well underway with Andy Serkis directing Tom Hardy. And there is the Morbius yep. film with Jared Leto, Craven the Hunter, and another spinoff. Uh, with the characters Silver Sable and Black Cat, and a Sinister Six film that got shelved. Sony, which once felt the clock ticking of generating a Spider-Man film every three years or so to prevent a rights reversion to Disney, now has plenty of pictures to make. And the studio also won Best Animated Feature Oscar for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, a smash hit they made on their own. Yeah, so that's a whole other thing that they can now explore more and not have to worry about any connections. And according to this Deadline article, which got released uh, probably about five or six hours ago, uh, no comment from Marvel or Disney yet. So we'll see. And the thing, this is this is just, uh, uh, as of right now, obviously talks, negotiations can yeah. change at the drop of a hat. So this all could be for naught, but I saw this. It's already all over the web, no pun intended. Um, and I just I thought this would be kind of interesting to mention. You don't intend a lot of puns, do you? They just happen they just organically. Roll out. <laughs> they just happen organically. They just roll out. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good one. That's an interesting one. KB, so any other final thoughts before we move on to the interesting piece of news? I'm just curious to see what Sony's going to do with it. See where they go. It's almost like they're resetting things. Yeah. It's almost like they're getting... They want to make their own universe completely. It's almost like yeah. they've been separated from the Matrix yep. and were plugged back in. They're plugging back in. Basically. Speaking of, also from Variety... The Matrix 4 is underway. Get ready to re-enter the Matrix. Lana Wachowski is set to write and direct a fourth film set in the world of the Matrix, with Keanu Reeves and Carrie Ann Moss reprising their roles as Neo and Trinity, respectively. Warner Brother Pictures and Village Roadshow Pictures will produce and globally distribute the film. Warner Brother Pictures Group Chairman, I can't even pronounce his name, Toby Emmerich, made the announcement on Tuesday, which is today, mm-hmm. when we're recording this. He, he said, we could not be more excited to be re-entering the Matrix with Lana. Lana is a true visionary, a singular and original creative filmmaker, and we are thrilled that she is writing, directing, and producing this new chapter in the Matrix universe. 
So in w- addition to Lana Wachowski, the script was also written by Alexander Heman and David Mitchell. Just as of note, uh, Lana Wachowski is also producing uh, with Grant Hill. And sources say the film is set to begin predic- production at the top of 2020. So early 2020, it's going to start production. And the other sisters, I guess, not involved? No mention? I don't know. Usually they're usually they're always somewhat involved. Well, it was the Wachowski together. brothers, right? Yeah. So I don't. Now I don't they're know. sisters. Yeah. So I don't know the. I don't know the the reasons that. Oh. oh. Well, we'll have to we'll have to see. We come in totally like cold. We, we don't yeah. we don't have we don't do any information. We don't look up, look stuff up. We're just we're just shooting at the hip right here. So yeah, that's, I just picked this article. Figured it was cool. I like the first two Matrix movies. Third Couldn't stand was, the third. Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious to see if it's the fourth is like is it going to be a reimagining? Is it going to be a reboot? I don't know. Well, if anything, like The Force Awakens proven is that you could take those older characters and put them back on and people will still love them if you've got diehard sure. fans. so Very, very true. So it could go well. It could go not so well. <laughs> well, I love that you mentioned The Force Awakens because our next news bit, Ewan McGregor is set to return as Obi-Wan Kenobi in a Disney Plus series. Again, I got this article also from Variety and you can find that article in the show notes as well. And the article states... Ewan McGregor is in talks to return as Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi in a series for Disney+. Plus. At this point, no other details on the potential series are available, but McGregor previously played the character in the three Star Wars prequels, The Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. There had been talks for years that McGregor would return in an Obi-Wan standalone film, but those plans were reportedly put on hold following the unsuccessful rollout of Star Wars standalone film Solo, which I actually liked Solo. I thought it was different. I still think uh, Rogue One was the best of the mm-hmm. newer ones, but I didn't mind Solo as I, a solo I, film. I liked no Solo. I, I think the reason why it failed is where, when they launched it. If you remember, they launched that at the same time as like Infinity Wars, Deadpool 2. Like, I think it was just cannibalization of, uh, of film. Uh, how many summer blockbusters can you go to? I think that was a big part it's of it. It's fatigue. It's fatigue. Because definitely. if you think about it, like Star Wars films are always released like December, right? Late November, early December, or late December. Why did they decide that one film had to be released in the summer when they knew they had Infinity Wars? Disney knew they had Infinity Wars on the plate. But I think they think maybe it's like two different like audiences or like audiences would still... But you've kept the schedule. Like why yeah. change it? Yeah, that's a good point. I I have no clue. But uh, if true, if this rumor is true, then the Obi-Wan series would be the third live action Star Wars show on Disney+. Plus. Does that article mention how old he is now? You and it does not. So sometimes I, they'll I, say. I don't know. I, yeah. There's, yeah, so details are still very scarce. I'm trying to think that was like what? When it would be set. Like 15 years ago? I'm trying to think when episode three came out. Well, The Phantom Menace was what? 2001, 2001 2002, 2002 something like that so maybe 12 years yeah it's been like probably like i'd say what two th- I, I you know what hey we have this thing called google and yep. well why don't you talk about why you like why the age matters to you what, what do you what do you think I, i'm just curious as to like what the it, what time frame they're going to set it in um you know are we are we talking a kind of in between kind of movie of between you know uh Attack of the Clones and uh, Revenge of the Sith. Or are we talking about something like completely after the Revenge of the Sith? I think, I think we'd kind of bridge between Revenge of the Sith and A New Hope, right? Well, it's a show, not a movie, right? Right. Okay, so then they, they have more time they, they to kind of they could do, that, do more to stuff play with it. it. Yeah. Um, so I just looked it up. Uh, Revenge of the Sith came out May 19th, 2005. So it's been about 14 years. So it's been a while. Yeah, it's yeah. been a while, but I mean, maybe we can see, you know, it's kind of kind of be like a middle ground between the Obi-Wan, the Obi-Wan we knew in Revenge of the Sith and the Obi-Wan yeah. we meet in A New Hope. Maybe we find kind of a, a happy medium here. Yeah. Like how he became that character, you know, or, or what he did in between that time. But the uh, that would be the third series. The other series that we've already known about is The Mandarin, mm-hmm. which is going to be uh, by John Favreau starring uh, Pedro Pascal. As well as a series based on Cassian Andor, which was the character uh, introduced in the Rogue One film. Mm-hmm. So, that, and Diego Diego Luna is going to be reprising his role from that film on that show as well. So, this would be the third. And I, I really think so that... So, before June Urso was born, probably. I believe so, yeah. 
But again, they, they can set that up with a period piece for the yeah. show as well. So I think it's very interesting. I think that one's cool, too, because you can build more on the Rogue One, because Rogue One did so well. And right. A lot of people loved it. I think I think that will do well. I think that, that one will definitely do well. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think it's interesting that, you know, this is the way the world is working, so you don't have to have all these major characters mm-hmm. with this fandom. Same thing with the Marvel side, with the Disney Plus shows. Mm-hmm. They're going to be doing, like, high um budgeted television shows for this streaming service i think they're going all out when does it become too much well i think i think it's all going to be a push to get this streaming service i was actually talking to a friend of the show and a friend of mine but he listens to the show uh this guy alex a friend of mine and we were talking about it and we saying between hulu between disney plus between i think warner brothers is putting their own one out there that's going to have hbo and you got dc or, and... and then but the dc is dc going to be rolled into that because it's warner brothers yep so I'm wondering if, if there's how many streaming will get rolled into Disney and like yeah. before we know are we down to two instead of or the I 50 think, million that we got? I think Disney Plus is going to be like an extra like five bucks if you already have a Hulu subscription. So why wouldn't you do it? Yeah. And get that too. So then you'd have Amazon, Netflix, Warner Brothers like. Yeah. Uh, Amazon Prime, Netflix, Hulu. Uh, but I was thinking that was a show. Disney Plus. DC um, Universe, CBS All Access, NBC is going to come out with their own universe uh, streaming service. I, I was, but I was thinking of it more as like the shows that are going to be on Disney Plus. At what point is that too much? Oh, true. But again, mm. if, but I think we're living in a society, and this is the the conversation we had. Nobody watches really episodic television anymore. Nobody's yep. like, oh, I got to catch that, you know, this week. And- yeah, it's it's we like to sit down and binge watch. We don't want to wait till next yeah. week for the next show. So once the series drops, now, now, we, now, exactly, yeah. and that's that's the you know supply of law and de- uh, supply and demand. And we don't have to be and we don't have to be rushed to watch it either if we don't want to. Right, or you can watch it at your own leisure. Yeah. You know, oh, we got to take the dog, take out, it with or you. I want to yeah. I want to go grab some food in between. I don't have to, yeah. you know. Granted, there's DVR and whatnot, but I just think the fact that you can binge at your own convenience yeah. is great. I mean, in the next what 15, 20 years, TV will be totally. Well, I think I think cable is going to be the new cheaper solution. If, if <laughs> you're going to have to be paying for all these you streaming know, services, plus all these streaming services. Yeah, but there's a lot of lot of good television shows yeah. coming to. Maybe, maybe your cable packages, your cable package instead of cable is internet plus services. True. Right? Who knows? That'd be awesome, right? Think about it. Get all your streaming services for like you know 150. Do you think Amazon Prime would go for that? Amazon Prime. Maybe not, but it doesn't have to be all of them. No, I know, but there's a lot of shows coming on to these streaming and services. Pr- Prime is kicking it up a notch. And speaking of Prime, good segue, KB, and streaming services. They're not getting. Se- l- they're, they're 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 definitely doing their um, putting in the effort. Way to bury the lead. Um, <laughs> so the boys season two premiere is way better than I ever could have hoped, says executive producer Seth Rogen. Was Who, he high or not? I don't know. Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen is very interesting. Uh, This article is via Newsweek. Um, The first season of The Boys premiered less than a month ago, but season two of the Amazon series is already deep into post-production. Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg, which are the producers of The Boys, described watching a rough cut of the second season premiere. And Seth Rogen is quoted as saying, yes, they already have more resources for the second season, and they are adding more characters. The scope of the show organically grows as the show continues. And we just watched the first episode of the second season this weekend. It was a wonderful thing. As producers, we were like, "This is way better than I ever could have hoped." So, what do you what do you think? I, and we're gonna do some spoilers right here for the boys. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it says, "How can it be get better?" So by the good. end, by the end of the first season of the boys, Butcher and the boys have devastated Vought, but mm-hmm. the super powered corporation is sure to strike back in season two. Vought CEO Mr. Edgar has numerous other superhero teams at his disposal, including Payback, which I don't know much about the Payback super team. So that's it's, I almost think of it as kind of like an X-Force, if you will. Yeah. Uh, led by a neo-Nazi named Stormfront in the original comics, uh, a character will be played by Aya Cash in upcoming episodes. The Seven may be in disarray but remain a major threat with Homelander more dangerous than ever. Now, KB, you've finished the series mm-hmm. now. What are your overall thoughts, and where do you expect to see season two go? Well, I mean, Homelander's your your all-powerful character in this universe. Uh, so, I mean, I would think it's got to come to a head where he just goes all crazy on everything. I, I just feel like that's that's the 
way that it should go, given what we've seen so far. Um, to say that this other team, team payback, you said it was. It looks. That's what yeah, it sounds. Yeah. Like. So to to say that they they'd be the ones to stop them doesn't doesn't really seem like uh, doesn't really seem like that would be the the setup. But you also have what's his name, uh, the main character there, Billy Billy Butcher, Billy Butcher, Billy, yeah. Billy Butcher, who like we his world just got rocked in that last episode. Very true. So th- that's just a huge question mark. That like, well, how does that whole will thing it, pan out? Will it? Uh, does it change he, his his outlook? Yeah, I I don't know. And you know, like light spoilers here, but you know, they they mentioned that uh, in the first season that his wife was presumed dead because she was raped by Homelander. And we find out that that may not be the case toward the end of season one. So where do we go from there? Where do we go? Do you think Homelander becomes a little bit more human? Do we think no. he's going to, you don't think he's going to be human? No, he, he by just some... melted off what's her name's face. But that's before, that's once he discovered the truth. I don't think it makes him any more human. Hmm. Well, I'm curious to see if But that's, that's gonna... the great thing about that show. It's so morally compromising. <laughs> <laughs> that. Well, that's I was trying to. I've been recommending that show to a bunch of friend of my, friends of mine, and I've been saying it's it's just interesting to watch heroes with that that are just like their their moral compass is is total out of whack. That they're morally bankrupt. They just they do whatever they want, and there's 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 nobody to really oppose them because they're the they're the end all be all. They're the heroes. More more importantly, will the deep recover from the dolphin incident? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I'm sorry, that part just had me just hysterical. What like. porpoise did that serve? <laughs> what porpoise? Uh, well, this is a good time. I'm living on porpoise. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> all right. We're, before bad we get, puns. Yeah, before we get into more bad jokes, we're going to take a break. And when we come back from break, we'll be talking about some of our favorite things, and we're going to have a little Q&A. You get but, to know about us? Yeah, a little find out some uh, info about us and... Uh, Kevin Smith is taking a trip to Eternia. Mm. We'll hear more after the break. Hey, everyone. I want to quickly tell you about 4041 Media. 4041 Media is a collection of podcasts in the southern New England area. And in addition to the great show that is Free Your Geek, you can check out 4041media.com and listen to the Psych Your Crime podcast to figure out why the crazies commit the crimes that they do. Or if movies are more your thing, check out the cast of characters at Movie Theater Time Machine. You can hear all of that at 4041media.com. That's 4041media.com. 4041media. For listeners, by listeners. He-Man, He-Man. Who's the big guy with the muscles? Here's He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Skeletor is his enemy. He-Man, He-Man. If He-Man, Skeletor, and Castle Grace go, you have to put the castle together. You're doomed, He-Man. Oh, yeah? Watch this action, Dad. He-Man. Now I have the power. He-Man and Skeletor each sold separately. Castle Grayskull also sold separately from the Masters of the Universe collection from Mattel. X-Men, the evil mutant's plan their attack. As Juggernaut harnesses his battering ram, Magneto reveals his magnetic force. Leave the attack, Juggernaut. But waiting are the X-Men. Evil mutants. Wolverine flashes claws of steel, while Cyclops turns on laser power. This city is a speed limit. And the giant apocalypse is powerless by the mighty Colossus. Lost again, Magneto. X-Men and Evil Mutants, each sold separately from Toy Biz. Krang, the master brain from Dimension X. Ally of the evil Shredder and Baxter Stockman, the wickedly winged scientists are out to destroy the Ninja Turtles. What the? Right, Ace Duck, the turtle's tough feathered friend, along with Ninja Sprog, who's always hopping for action. Always ready to fight on the side of the turtle. You'll be riveted to your scene. From Playmate. And welcome back to Free Your Geek. And now we go into our next piece. Uh, as you heard in that intro, we had some commercials from He-Man and the Ninja Turtles and uh, X-Men. Uh, just some childhood memories of yep. ours. Uh should be fun. Figures. Yeah, but before we get into the little Q&A portion of this podcast, which we will talk about a little bit, um, I want to talk about the third piece of news, which is Kevin Smith, our 
you know, the the king geek himself, if you will. Um, Who's the queen geek? Who I don't know. Rosario Dawson. Maybe Rosario Dawson. Maybe uh, Jessica Negri, who is a cosplayer. I don't know. Uh, there's, I, I guess the argument. You could have made, said Carrie Fisher before. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, and I don't even know if Kevin Smith is the king. I just think he's like. He's kind of like up there. He's ro- close. He's not royalty. Stan Lee royalty, but, he, but he's like he's yeah. you know for for what he's yeah. done, the the books he's written, yeah. the movies he's directed. Well, he's coming back, but this time he's coming back to Netflix, and uh, again by Variety, Kevin Smith surprised audiences at the PowerCon convention by announcing a new anime, He Man, and it's going to be a series exclusively for Netflix. The new series, titled Masters of the Universe Revelation will take place in the Mattel toy-inspired world and will focus on some of the unresolved storylines of the classic 1980s show. Smith will serve as showrunner and executive producer. And he is quoted as saying, and this is typical, this is this is my joker, this is a, right up my alley, mm-hmm. I am eterna, I can't even pronounce, I am eternally grateful to Mattel TV and Netflix for entrusting me with not only the secrets of Grayskull, but also their entire universe. In Revelation, we pick up right where the classic era left off to tell an epic tale of what may, what may be the final battle between He-Man and Skeletor. Brought to life with the most metal character designs powerhouse animation can contain in the frame, this is the Masters of the Universe story you always wanted to see as a kid. Mattel Television is producing alongside executive executive producer Rob David, the vice president of Mattel TV and author of He-Man, The Eternity War. Writers include Eric Carrasco from Supergirl, Mm -hmm. TV show Supergirl, Tim Sheridan from Reign of the Supermen, Dia Mishra from Magic the Gathering, Mm -hmm. and Mark Bernardin, who if you listen to Kevin Smith's podcast... Uh, he was on, Mark Bernardin wrote Alphas, but he's also the co-host of uh, Fat Man Beyond. Mm-hmm. Uh, Castlevania's powerhouse animation will oversee the animation for the series. Hmm. So Rob David also said, Masters of, the Universe's, Masters of the Universe has been a cultural phenomenon for generations, inspiring fans to discover their own power within. Fans of this franchi- franchise have been waiting for the continuation of these characters and Kevin Smith as a Masters superfan himself is the perfect champion and partner to expand the canon through a dynamic animated series on Netflix. So earlier we were talking about the, the streaming services. Now, again, banking on that nostalgia, we talked a few episodes ago, Stranger Things, very 80s theme. Again, I think now with like all the young kids from the 80s and 90s, now adults and have disposable mm-hmm. income, I think this is perfect to kind of get, you know, your foot in the He Man was my absolute favorite as a kid. Like that was like the first major, like toy line I really collected yep. that I remember collecting. Like I had all of them. Yeah. I had Castle Grayskull. I had Snake Mountain. I had all the vehicles. I had. I had the uh, Snake Mountain. Battle I didn't have Grayskull. I had, um, you know, all the different figures, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that She-Ra. later. I had I had probably like ten to fifteen Shira action figures too, dude. I'm serious. I loved the He Man universe. I had. Both. I just didn't know there was that many different ones oh, at yeah. the time. Oh yeah, tons, tons, dude. I, I wonder if they'll put the old episodes back on Netflix too. I believe that would be awesome. I think they might. Are they be, already? On? They might be already on. I'll have to double check that. But I believe uh, there's an, a 2002 series that I want to check out that is not on Netflix uh, that I'd really like to check out because it was more updated yeah. and it was more. It was kind of akin to. You know, got a lot. Of, I think I remember that. It got a little bit less cheesy. Like again, talking to Alex that I mentioned a little earlier, we were talking about that, and I try to watch old He-Man cartoons, Masters of the Universe mm-hmm. cartoons now, mm-hmm. and I kind of like eye roll because of how like corny they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like again, I think you know we and we we've talked about it like the X-Men, the animated <laughs> series, Batman, the animated series, like gargoyles. Mm-hmm. You can deal with like a little bit more mature subject matter where you're not yep. really talking down to kids. So I'm wondering if it's going to have like the original slant where it's going to be very cheesy or if it's going to be a little bit more modernized. Um, but I think it'll gonna, cater to the adults. It's going to be anime style. Yeah. So, I mean, you look at the other anime that's out there, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I mean, I don't even remember how the, the, the original series left off. So when they say it's picking up, it's like... Well, then you might have to... So, hey, we got plenty of time to go uh, catch <laughs> up. But could you just imagine Orko in an, like anime style Orko? Orko. 
That would be insane. Many faces. Manny faces, Manny yeah. faces, man at arms, Tila. Oh my God! There's yeah. this just such nostalgia, such nostalgia. And I'm super excited because I know Kevin Smith is a super big geek. He's gonna, I, he's gonna do the the anything French he does is yeah. He's gonna do it with love. Exactly. I was gonna say the same thing. We've seen him do you know uh, issues of Daredevil, Green Arrow. He just did a uh, Hit Girl. Hit Girl, Hit Girl yeah. Like there, yeah. there's there's a lot. He he has passion for these characters, and he'll write for he'll write for any company. Too. Yeah, he's he doesn't have uh, image, dynamite, Marvel, like whatever. As long as it's a good story, he can yeah. bring he can bring his style, man. I'm very I'm very excited to see where they go with that. Yeah, but uh, now getting into the last portion of our show, <laughs> KB and I were kind of talking, and we kind of you know it's kind of interesting to try to kick up and come up with ideas. Like we can do news bits all the time, yeah. but we also like or countdowns can, or countdowns. But we came up with the idea to do you know characters from across the. Uh, spectrum video games yep. books television fighting against each other that was a unique idea it was a lot of fun yeah you know it's different and, and we figured like you know we've we've had the show for a couple of years now and yeah. uh we never really kind of gave a little background on us on who you're listening to who's coming through yeah. your phone or your computer where do we get this passion from for or our just, culture yeah, yeah just just more about us what 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 do you want to know about us so KB and I just came up. I came up with some very safe questions. I think KB came up with some uh, more out of the box. Yeah, yeah, I think questions so. maybe. But and we they're, just they're safe, but yeah, they're they're out of the box. We just kind of like pick each other's brain and like go uh, cold turkey and just off the off the cuff and they're not PG thirteen or anything. So. Okay, well that's good to know. All right, well do you want to start off or do you want me to start off? You start off. Let's see what you got. All right, we'll start off with a safe one. So I, I said uh, I earlier I mentioned that He Man Masters of the Universe mm-hmm. was my first uh, action figure line that I like collected pretty uh pretty intensely as far mm-hmm. as that goes so what was your first uh what was your first action figure line that you truly like first action figure line that you or that you remember that you really collected uh transformers see i was never a transformer fan yeah. so okay, it's like so- i wasn't the biggest he-man fan like i liked he-man but i wasn't the biggest he-man fan so yeah growing up for me it was masters of the universe then gi joe yep uh, I also I from the young from the like the Which, longest time I remember my mother buying me for Christmas I must have been like four or five the superpowers line with mm-hmm. where you like you know Robin with the karate chop action yep. uh, so I was always into DC even back then I don't re- exactly remember collecting all of them but I know that I had a handful of them yeah for, for me the Transformers was the whole idea of like just having like this vehicle that you turn into a robot and so, back and kind of the the puzzle of it it's like a rubik's cube but like different you know okay i, was I, say, I love that part of it was it was it the fact that it was like a puzzle or the fact that like hey i got i get to have a, a toys that are cars and vehicles and robots exactly but it's, it's like it's you saying, two it's, toys for for one i still feel that way now i still collect transformers <laughs> now okay well that's, that's what i'm gonna ask you so let's let's kind of expand on that a little bit so transformers today are, are they as good i as, think they're better really i think they're better uh the generation ones like when i was a kid they broke all the time because they weren't, they weren't meant to bend in certain ways that you might have wanted to bend them as a kid. Okay, so to like get position, like that the art- pose, the and like whatever. And now, like the articulation is just so much better. I mean, we're talking kneecaps and feet movement and and uh, hip hip movement. And how do you think about it? You're taking a, a a vehicle that transforms into a robot in in almost their, their newest line, uh, Siege War for Cybertron. Almost every single one, even the bigger ones, have hip movement, and that makes great for posability. So, so I, I guess my follow up question to you though is: so the ones today, like I remember from when I was a kid, the Transformers that mm-hmm. I did have, I had a, I had a handful. Yeah, they were very almost like blocky, oh, not mm-hmm. blocky, but like they were very rigid. They were very square pieces, like that you'd fold in. That's why they're so much better now because they still get the vehicles, but they don't have that blocky look anymore. But I guess that's the thing. I kind of like that blocky look because they made them look like like robots. But here's the thing: is those blocky looks that you had back in the day. Those weren't the looks you were getting in the, in the TV show. Gotcha. So you know what I mean? Like Optimus Prime as a toy didn't really look all that much like Optimus Prime in the show. Right. Bumblebee was like a little tiny. I, I got a reissue of the Bumblebee. Yeah, like a little I, tiny I had Bumblebee. One. And if you look at the show one or the movie one, the Transformers animated movie, because that was when it was like super, super big. Um, in fact, uh, I just collected a whole bunch of um, Transformers and I just wanted them because they looked. When we talk about hitting that that um, you know that um, nostalgia, it was the characters that I got. They all now have really good looking models that look like they did 
in the movie when I was a kid. Well, that that was they didn't have that before. My question would be: Do they looked kind of too polished? That's what I'm, that's what my concern is. Do no. they look too sleek or too no? Because that that to me, I will have to take a look next time I'm in Target or whatever, and just take a look at them because I almost feel like they look too plasticky. From what, like they, they are plasticky, they are a bit more plasticky, but that's kind of the beauty of them. And the other thing that they do is that the joints come off now. So a lot of times, like Transformers, the joints would break. You could break, like Optimus Prime's legs, that was like one of the biggest ones were the legs because they were spring kind of loaded, so they would like break off or snap off. And so like now, they make the parts so they come off. So if you turn it too hard, it doesn't break, it pops off. Got you. So it's going to last longer. So it's overall a better quality product. Um, and they are reissuing. And the great thing about the new reissues is Takara, that originally invented the line, um, has been involved in all of the newer toy models that they've been coming out with. So they're all Takara influenced and that's why they're getting that look back too. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Interestingly, there's an Optimus Prime coming out from Comic Con or that came out at Comic Con. A Ghostbusters Optimus Prime crossover. So is it the, the It's Optimus e Prime one? Nope. It's uh, I got the Ecto one. But the Optimus Prime is similar to the one I had as a kid. But it's Ghostbusters, so it has like Slimer, and instead of a little roller car, it has the, uh, what is it, the brick? And then it has like, um, in the back, you can actually put the Ecto-1 in the back, and it's all white with Ghostbuster oh, logoing, cool. and yeah, it's it's super awesome. Uh, so yeah, like there, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, lo I, I love the line, you know? It, it brings me back that nostalgic feeling every time I look at one. I agree with that, and I, just to, to kind of add my two cents from the Masters of the Universe side, I just enjoyed the characters, and uh, I talked about this uh, to another friend of mine recently, but I remember going into Toys R Us when Toys R Us was like the end-all, be-all mm -hmm. for a kid, and I think obviously times have changed with technology yeah. and whatnot, but I remember be Skeletor being in Toys R Us and mm -hmm. taking pictures with Skeletor. Like, yep. I miss that feeling. I think like yeah. with the relaunch, I know Toys R Us is coming back on like they're on a smaller there, scale yeah. or whatever. If they make it more of a, an event like that, I think it could help. Events would help. Yeah, I think it would help stores. with uh, getting kids in there and then buying stuff. So maybe we should get to my first question. Because yeah, it go for piggybacks it. off of your question. Oh, do it. Um, so what is... <laughs> I want to put it the right way. What is the toy that you owned that you were most upset about breaking as a child? You know what? This is interesting. <laughs> And I will go. I will go with this. Uh, and what happened? Yes, I'm going to tell you the story. <laughs> it wasn't me, Matthew Rebello. I still am mad at you for this. Uh, I was in Catholic school, and we had Catholic school. Uh, it was raining out, so we had recess in the basement. And for recess, I brought in some of my WWF action <laughs> figures, the plastic ones uh, from like the 1990s. And I had Superfly Jimmy Snuka, and it was one of the ones where you put your finger on the back he had a little ridge you pull him down and he would spring jump yep. to do a super super uh fly splash i remember those and matthew who i'm still mad at made him jump and it, it hit off the cement floor and shattered the head popped off because really? it was all it was all plastic so it fell from like you know like three feet up and it fell just right and i was inconsolable with like the rest of the day so you didn't break it i didn't break it, it was, okay but what about something you broke uh ooh, um you know, I've always been pretty good with my I, I toys. Was too. Um, the I'll tell you what I used to do though that was really stupid. Um, do you remember right around the time when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles mm -hmm. 2: The Secret of the Ooze came out? They yep. came out with the movie star turtles. So yep. they were they had like more <laughs> they had similar to what you were talking about with the Transformers. They had like the sockets, they had all mm -hmm. rubber arms and legs. Yeah. They the only thing that was plastic on them were their shells. Yeah. So I thought I was cool. Like, these things can't break, and I was hucking them down the sidewalk and stuff. The back of their shells get all scuffed up, and looking at it now, I'm like, you're an idiot, <laughs> Jay Free. Like, why, why are you ruining your stuff? These would have been really cool to, like, keep, and, like, these classic figures, and, uh, yeah, I ruined them. Um, they're still there. I mean, I still have all of them, but yeah. they're just the, the shells are all scuffed up and scratched. Yeah. And yeah. So for, that For me, it was Optimus Prime. I broke his legs. No. And I broke two Optimus Prime. Well, Prime's that makes legs. sense why you're, you're talking about the joints being yes. the way they are now. Yeah. So yeah, what's your next one? Uh, so we, let's leave the realm of uh, toys, action figures. You say toys, I say action figures. That's that. That about sums it up. Action figures. No, they're toys. No, they're action figures. <laughs> we have a debate on that all day. Um, <laughs> let's talk about comic books. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was the first 
comic book series that you like remember seriously collecting as far as like issues or, see, or specific see, runs? I didn't get into collecting till I was a teenager. Okay. So I was like probably 13, 12, 13 when I started collecting. Yeah, I read a few, you know, younger, like some X Men stuff and things like that. But was like that, that the series? Like I'm saying, but what's no. the series that you're like, the oh, series, I have to get the next issue to the see? The series the I actually collected was uh, Shadow Hawk by Image. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because that was when Image first came out. Shadowhawk was like a few issues in, and I just I fell in love with it because it was this this uh, Batman kind of character that took justice into his own hands and broke people's spines but never killed them. So it took it a bit further than Batman. Um, but also he was HIV positive, and at the time, that was a huge deal. Oh, I thought you were say at the time I was HIV. <laughs> no, not you. No, no. Maybe you got you to no, specify no, for no. this. No, I'm talking about the character, Shadowhawk. Um, and also you didn't know who he was. They didn't even announce who he, you didn't even know the character's uh, identity, true identity, until pff, Sixth Issue or something like that. So oh, it, was, cool. it was really interesting. Uh, so that kind of got me into, and then with, with Image, because Image was still kind of new, got me into like Savage Dragon and Spawn. And like, so I really kind of started with Image Comics as far as collecting goes. So I had a handful of DC comics. I remember yeah. t- I have tons of older Batman stuff, but I never, I never really like recalled or recollected when yeah. like I really got into comics, but the ones that get me, 1991, Jim Lee, you already mentioned it, the X-Men. Yeah. Jim Lee's art, and just starting with the X-Men number one with the blue team, the gold yeah. team, and then the X-Men. I had that issue. Followed, I had all Wish the I covers. I I have, I've downloaded them all again on digital, but I still have like, the good I, ones. I think I collected yeah. the first like 50 issues of yeah. that straight. Like that was like, yeah. and that's when like, you know, comics at that time were, you know, the print of them, like we didn't have necessarily. You get high off the ink. Well, <laughs> okay. I, I know nothing of that, but what I was saying was we didn't have like, I wasn't aware at that age of like comic book shops or like a Newberry comics mm-hmm. that would hold the, so I would have to go into the newsstand every month yep. and look for them and pick there. them up. And then up to the point where Marvel had its own subscription yep. and I'd have it delivered to my door. I used to do that with the GI Joe, believe it or not. When, you, should, Joe when you used to actually have to send in little cards or like things like that to, yeah, man. to, pres- to uh, subscribe. Yeah, and the other thing about those newsstands is when they were out of the issue, it wasn't like now where it's like, oh, yeah, I can get that next week or I can just download it. Like, you know, okay. back as a kid, you missed them. Well, following up on that, what was your favorite series of all time? So you, but that's the one that you got into. But what's of everything you've read, what's been your favorite series to read? My favorite series of all time? That's a loaded question. Wow. I, I, I really don't know. I was thinking more when I was a kid. Wasn't prepared for that one. Okay, well, think think about it for a second. Um, I'll give you mine while you're thinking. Uh, mine actually came a little bit later, uh, into my twenties. It was uh, X Factor Volume Three by Peter David. It was more like X Factor mm-hmm. Investigations with Madrox, and it had that like like more of a noir type mm-hmm. of feel. Other than like, I just thought the writing was really good. Um, the tone was really good. I, I just really really enjoyed X Factor, seeing Madrox kind of like do his own thing with his own detective agency. And taking other X Men characters in, like Longshot and mm. and Monet and Siren and Strong Guy, yeah, Richter. You know what I mean? Like I I, I really enjoyed that. How about you? Let's now that I give you time to think. I honestly would have to say, if I'm thinking younger, it was Spawn. Spawn was so different from everything else. And why is that? Uh, the the character was just so unique. Um, you had you know Al Simmons, this former co op, not co op, <laughs> co op. Uh, this former, um, you know, Marine operative who basically, you know, was a, an assassin who, uh, you know, dies and, you know, somebody kills him and, you know, loses his family because he dies and he wants to get back to his family and he makes a deal with Nabulja and Nabulja and it just, there was just something about it that just felt so human compared to a lot of the other stuff and I think that's what Emmett, that was, that's what was making Image famous is they were doing a lot of these books like Shadowhawk and uh, Spawn and other things like that that brought you, a different story. You hadn't seen it before. You hadn't seen it before like with Marvel or DC. Um, so that's what really drew me to the Spawn character and, and all the characters within it were really good. And plus McFarlane, you know, that was kind of like the book that's kind of like all his own. You know what I mean? Like he's always worked on other stuff. He's in Spider-Man. Great, but... That was like his own so beast. I was a early teenager when Image was like first blowing up. So yeah. my thing with Image was Gen 13. Yep. I loved Gen 13. After, yeah. it, was just, it was all like, you know, 
like again you're 13 years old and you see like all these like super like sexy like mm-hmm. women and then like the all the characters are talking like i did as a as a teenager you know and you had like the grunge movement yep. and and you know uh oh my god what, what, i can't think of the band's name uh i'm blanking on the name but they sing black hole sun mm-hmm. uh soundgarden thank you soundgarden was like huge right now yep. like that, that then and then i was just like all of that like pop culture was the mtv generation in yeah. a comic book form and i thought that was kind of cool um, last follow up question with that, and then I got one more question. Well, where are all my questions? I get well, to ask this you? is all uh, about comic books. <laughs> oh, it's unless, all comic books. Yeah, unless you okay. have unless you have something with comic books. Oh no, 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 no. Okay, so no. my last one in revolving around comic books is so we talked about your the series that you collected seriously. You're the first one that you remember mm-hmm. collecting. Now, out of every single comic book uh, story you've read, what's been your favorite run as far as storyline goes? <sighs> So I'll tell you mine while you're thinking about that because I actually have three. Mm-hmm. Um, the Long Halloween, I thought, is just an mm-hmm. amazing, amazing Batman story. And then speaking of Batman being my favorite character, Batman Hush. We talked about it a few mm-hmm. weeks ago with the animated film, but like the comic book series dr- drawn by Jim Lee and, and just like the art was great. The storyline was great. It spanned the, the 12 issues, yep. introduced a new villain. It was so well done. Um, it looked amazing. And then my other favorite one, again, a little bit younger when I was growing up again, the early 90s to the mid 90s uh, from the Marvel side, Age of Apocalypse. I just thought the mm-hmm. concept was so cool. Like, oh, Xavier's son went back in time and tried to kill Magneto. So his father's dream mm-hmm. would be realized. But he accidentally killed Xavier. Now we're living in an alternate universe without yeah. Professor Charles Xavier. And just to see the way like some of these characters were reimagined in the yeah, different even characters like Gwen Stacy and like, yeah, just added back in. So I thought th- those have been my three favorite uh, story arcs, if you will. Um, I just don't know. Even even one that honestly, just jumps out. As honestly, memorable. honestly, I. I there's a lot now because I probably read a lot more now than I okay, did then. Just throw throw one at me. So I'm gonna say uh, Hawkeye, the the recent Hawkeye. Uh, not recent. It's probably a few give, years. Give back. us a synopsis, possible. But basically, spoilers. it's what goes on with Hawkeye in his downtime from the Avengers. Um, art's really done well. It was it, it, really great story. Uh, New York Times bestseller. Uh, basically, Hawkeye is. Um, he buys like this apartment tenement tenement building and you know he feels obligated to take care of the people and all in this building um and there's some gangsters he has to deal with and then kate bishop's also around in this and uh it it sometimes segues off to kate and stuff that she's doing um it was just like it was a good run of i think i want to say like 15 issues i can't remember but it, it was it was just really really captivating and the art is just fantastic i i, I bought the the hardcover you know um novel of it and it was just phenomenal the next one i would have to say is the visions the whole vision family thing you haven't checked that out yet have you no i haven't you, you need to check that vision, out vision see vision was never a character that i really like but this is about. but this but this you you would care about this like because he makes his own family um and it's just so interesting to see um you know uh the emotions that come with that um so like that was a really good one my other, my other one, I, I would have to say, uh, the the White Knight, Batman. That's the a White great Knight. recent recent uh, series. You know, recent. Definitely. There's just a lot of good recent stuff, and I think the thing is that there's so much stuff that we're getting good stuff. Not all of it's good, but some of the stuff we're getting is really, really, really good. You know, so yeah. So those would probably be my three. That I would... Okay, I have one question, but I'll save that to the end. But okay, well, good. So Thank get, you for that. Get to hit you up with a question now. Yeah, hit me up with a question, then. Uh... I'm going to hit you up with a couple of them. Okay, go for it. We're going to change gears completely. Not completely. Um, For you, I know you're a big Ninja Turtles fan. Yeah. So first question that I have is, growing up, who was your favorite non-Ninja Turtle character? Wow, this is this is super weird because my last question revolves around Ninja Turtles as well, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> um, My favorite non-Ninja Ninja Turtle character? Casey Jones. Hands yeah. down. Casey Jones was badass. Um, what if I said villain? Villain? Are we talking strictly cartoon? No, but uh, no, no shredder or. Well, to me, like, 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 like goons, like, like, like the goons. Like the I like, like Baxter Stockman. Cartoon. I thought you were going to say that. Baxter really Stockman. Did. Uh, cause I think it was, again, the cartoon, he was very, uh, like kind of bumbling doofus. Yeah. But, at the same time, I love the characters that don't just challenge you physically, but challenge you mentally. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he was an inventor 
in the comic books and then in the the cartoon series which is what first i yeah. went to the the comic series after because i was like six years old when the cartoon came out so that's what kind of hooked me first yeah. but um and that's another toy line actually that yeah. i collected like crazy yeah. i had like 200 ninja turtles, turtles. Yeah. like figures um yeah i'd say baxter stockman especially after he did an experiment and that fly flew in and then he kind of like yep. became the fly because not only was he you know he was still a bumbling idiot but now he could physically almost match the turtles which i thought was kind of cool and yeah. he brought something different to the table so yeah favorite non-turtle hero i'd say casey jones favorite villain i'd say baxter stockman post fly yeah. or rat king rat king i thought was awesome too yeah i loved him um in the cartoon um very good so my next question i'm gonna ask you this one's totally out, out of out of the uh out of right field what was growing up we all all of us our age growing up remember the ice cream truck in the neighborhood yep what was your favorite thing to get off the truck the wwf ice cream bars with the, <laughs> the wrestler with the wrestler the so with the fudge on the back and like the wrestler cookie yep. macho and man man and he'd open it up and you didn't know which one you're gonna get that's right, right. that's right, right. yeah I, well, I was a big wwf fan growing up and that was like the coolest thing. I forgot all about those. Yeah, those are those. And then if, if we were going to go non-geek thing, I I, can't, I don't remember the name of it, but it was a, a ice cream cone mm -hmm. wrapped in foil. It had on the bottom point of the cone, it had a little bit of fudge inside the oh, cone. Yeah, and it was, yeah, I think I it had like, it was I think it was a vanilla chocolate swirl, and it had like chocolate chips or something on the top. I used of to it. like those those push up things that had yeah. vanilla and chocolate ice cream in it. Yeah. Those, those that was like my favorite and they were like so cheap. Yeah. I just thought that was a different question. Ice, ice cream trucks. That's <laughs> that's funny. That, that well we are in the summer. Yeah. So I might as well ask about that. That's cool. I got one more for you but you can go ahead with your No no no, no that's cuz this, okay. this will segue into my new Here we go. Favorite female X-Men character growing up. Ooh, growing up. Uh okay, I'm going to base it on two Dazzler no, no, you would think uh, that the only time I knew of the Dazzler was from the movie and then the the actual video game before mm -hmm. I, I didn't read her in the comics at all. Like, really, yeah. uh, I, I collected a, a comic here and there, like some issues that focused mm -hmm. on her. But I never what grabbed me to or drove me to the X-Men, drew me to them was the, you know, the comic book. And then it kind of coincided with the animated series. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's it's rogue, rogue, hands down. Yeah. Like the the southern the south she's you know again like comic book version very beautiful woman southern drawl she's got that the southern accent. accent she's got she's just like she's powerful as hell the super and strength she's just, the yeah, flying she's just, and then the cool like the cool thing the was style like, the yeah, style like the, the the white streak in her yep. hair and then just the fact that she's like invulnerable and she can fly and she's got super strength but she also can't touch somebody like the, and that's, the tragedy behind it yeah, yeah it was just really cool like oh man this you know this girl and then i really like gambit i was drawn to gambit as my yeah. favorite hero and then just to see their relationship play out the way it did it's that's you know it's a stereotypical answer but but no i, I think it's a good answer for me my favorite female x-men character i always was fascinated with storm i i just i just love that whole idea of controlling the weather you know the the flying the um, just the whole, just her character overall we, as a leader, um, just always seemed like a, a, a good centerpiece to the X-Men that wasn't one of the originals, you know? She was a great addition. I She's, think, I think yeah. other than Wolverine, yeah. I'd argue Storm would be the most, yeah. you know, of, of all the, the giant size X-Men, maybe followed by Colossus after that, or yeah. maybe Nightcrawler. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I, but again, th th think about that with the giant size X-Men, then who was else? Banshee mm -hmm. and Warpath. Yep, I think, I think so. War Path, uh, Thunderbird and Thunderbird yep. died on a mission. But yeah, so I think, you know, besides Wolverine, I think she's the most popular from that issue. Like that's still around today that that character is yeah. had really good story arcs. She, she married T'Challa for crying yep. out loud. Uh, but yeah, she's, she was a great, and like you said, the weather control, like she could like make it hail violently or the flying in the, yeah, she could make it like a nice sunny day or she could hurl like lightning bolts at you. Yeah. Or just throw a gust of wind and push it. Yeah, out. I mean, if, if you think about how devastating nature can be, especially today, mm -hmm. think about like that now. You know, it's... think about how she could help with like climate control. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Global warming. Crazy. Storm, we need you. All right, last question, and then we're going to go into some recommendations and get out of here. Um, KB, you previously asked me about the Ninja Turtles. Uh, we have as our logo. We have it's in uh, homage mm -hmm. to the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. What is your least favorite? Ninja Turtle. My least favorite. What's your least favorite? And what's your favorite villain? Because I had that written down too. Let's start with favorite villain. And then you can think about. 
I'm gonna put them to, put put the villains together because I I just loved Bebop and Rocksteady. I thought you know they were just so dumb and comical and like they just they just added something to the show that you weren't getting anywhere else. I I just kind of lo- sometimes I'm I'm a sucker for those um, you know kind of brutes those, Simple, simpleton sim, sim, simpleton brutes. Um, especially remember the Ninja Turtles arcade game. I liked playing as against bosses. Them. I liked fighting them as bosses. Like that was really cool. Um, so yeah, so a lot of, and I like the toys. The toys were really done really well for those they had. I remember they had some pretty good parts and, uh, they were two of my favorites to, you know, it, like if I think of the Ninja Turtles battling, it's like, okay, I have Shredder and I have these two and that's the core. That's what I need to make my battle scene of, of turtles versus, you know, bad guys. Um, least favorite Ninja Turtle. Wow. I mean, every kid kind of liked Michelangelo, right? Right. I really liked Leonardo because he was a leader. I liked Donatello because he was so intelligent. Raphael, to me, was like depression. <laughs> you know, just always always kind of grumpy, always kind of like... Well, he's the one with the attitude. Yeah, he's the one, yeah. he's the, he was the hothead. And, and, and I get it, and I get it, but as a kid, I was... I don't know, that just didn't do anything for me as a kid. Okay, so that was as a kid, it would be Raphael? Yeah. What about now of the four? Doesn't mean you hate them. No, 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 no. It's just if my you were to rank favorite, them. My least favorite. So if I was to rank them now, I'd say Don, Leo, Mikey, then Raph still. Okay. I'd go just so, so you, you have my You're list. a Raphael guy, right? I'd go Raphael, Donatello, Leonardo, Michelangelo. You like the tragic figures? I, not tragic. I just feel like, you know, it's funny because Michelangelo was is kind of like, if you want to kind of compare it to the X-Men. Not that I'm saying a, I'm a huge Wolverine fan, but... He's like the Wolverine. He's the popular character. Ra- no, that... Raphael's like the Wolverine oh, character, okay. as far as attitude goes. Okay. Uh, Donatello's like the Beast. Leonardo would be more of a Cyclops. And uh, I think Michelangelo would kind of be like an Iceman. Like cra- okay. cracking the jokes, always wanting to have a good time. Yeah. yeah. And Or, or like a Jubilee that. or so- or something like yeah. that. And it's, it's and that's fine. But I think, again, to your point, when you're a kid, Michelangelo is the one that likes to have fun. And he gets all he the best jokes. And, and yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, you you kind of more identify with him. And I again, the intelligence with Donatello. Yeah. It was always Donatello and Raphael for me. Yeah. Sometimes Donnie edges out Raph and other times Raph edges out Don. But I think just for like raf raf's like kind of like the guy that's like i'm at the gym i need to be better i need to push myself yeah. harder i need to be you know stronger i need to be better and i think that's just you know leonardo's more poised donnie's more intelligent raf is just more i think like Ugh. brute force remember that first ninja turtle game the nintendo one the one that was hard as hell the one that was hard as hell and i just remember like always, I, never, I never beat that i never did either i've only gotten like halfway through that game and our good friend uh john he said he beat it twice i, I believe think, so if i remember correctly um but I always remember with that game, it's like I'd always start with Donatello because he had that long reach right. with the staff. And then Leo and then Mike. I would like reach wise is how I would kind of go. But so then is it, that how you're ranking your but, turtles? No, no, no. But then I kind of got different to it because I was like, if I go the other way, then I'll lose those characters earlier probably and have the better ones. So you sacrifice Raphael first. Yeah. What a jerk. No wonder, no wonder he's <laughs> mean all the time. And he's grumpy. <laughs> You're throwing them. That game was so ridiculously hard. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was was difficult. But still fun to play, and we'd recommend that. I I like the arcade one better, though. Yes. That one was so much fun. Well, speaking of recommendations, before we get out of here, uh, I wanted to give a couple of documentary recommendations. Okay. Uh, One of them I've I've purchased already on iTunes. um, But speaking of Ninja Turtles, this documentary is called Turtle Power. The Definitive History of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And you can purchase it on YouTube, Amazon Prime Video, Google Play, or you can rent or buy it on iTunes as hmm. well. And it's such a great look at from the conception on how it started as a parody of Daredevil yep. until like the multi-million dollar franchise it became yep. and just the popularity that it obtained. It touches on you know, the, the cartoon, the, the action figures, the movies, um, the, Afra, the horribly um, accepted... Boy band, the toys, the Ninja Turtles, or the 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 yeah. boy band, yeah, yeah. Uh, out of our shells tour, yeah. like all that stuff, and it goes throughout the whole gamut. So if you're a turtle fan, definitely check that out. Conversely, as we mentioned, Kevin Smith uh, doing a He Man anime series for Netflix. You can check out the Power of Grayskull, the definitive history of He Man and the Masters of the Universe. That's exclusively on Netflix because Turtle Power is not on Netflix. But if you want to catch up on like how He Man was created, you know, and as far as starting off with like Conan and being like a barbarian, and then 
turning into the He-Man franchise with the action figures. Uh, check that out. I, I watched like the first 15 minutes of it. Mm-hmm. It's great. Definitely check that out. And then I have, lastly, I have a podcast uh, that I want to make you aware of. Uh, Friends of the show, uh, Next Level Radio Online, has another podcast called We Have to Go Back, which they basically review uh, all seven seasons of the television show Lost, which is my favorite television right show. Uh, and I actually, the two hosts uh, are really, really uh, fun to listen to, and they, mm-hmm. they debate. I don't always agree with them, but I, I yep. like listening to them, and they have unique uh, takes on each episode and the characters. So I, I have a recommendation if people haven't it. seen it yet. It's been out a while, a long time actually on Netflix, but you know Netflix has a lot of those small shows. Uh, the Toys That Made Us. It's Interesting. about the rise of some of our favorite toys from the 80s and how they came to be. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. Do you know where that we can find that? Uh, it's on Netflix, I believe. Okay. What's it called? I think it's The Toys That Made Us. Let me let me check the Google machine. Yeah, yeah, check the Google machine. Uh, I, I think it's, it should still be on there. I saw it on my list the other day. Yes, it is on Netflix. The Toys um, That Made Us. It's, you know, just some of the stuff that it, it talks about. Uh, Lego is one. It says Star Wars, Barbie, G.I. Joe. Learn how your favorite toys came to life and conquered the world. Yep, so every episode's like an hour too of like the history of the time we should do we should do a show where we just watch all these documentaries and then talk about them yeah i think that'd be kind of fun yeah but uh netflix and and amazon prime video should be Mm -hmm. kicking us some money for this now yeah uh yeah so check that out check out uh he-man check out uh turtle power and check out the toys that made us three great documentaries Mm -hmm. and then check out we have to go back on next level radio online all the links will be in the show notes and with that we are out of here kb hit him with the catchphrase Get your geek on. And free your geek. Goodbye, everybody. Ciao. You're still here. It's over. Go home.